Good afternoon and welcome to the Milwaukee Press Club's latest newsmaker virtual event. I'm Press Club President Gene Miller. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to be talking baseball with some fine sports folks led off by Tom Hodricourt, longtime Journal Sentinel Brewers beat writer. But uh, first, we want to thank our sponsors for helping to make today happen. From the Wisconsin Press Club, that would be Spectrum News One and our sustaining sponsor, Miller Koss. Wispolitics.com, as always, is with us, as well as a event partner. We want to thank their sponsors, UW-Milwaukee, the Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at Pabst, the Milwaukee Police Association, the Firm Consulting, the Medical College of Wisconsin, and Spectrum. And as always, we would like to uh, remind you that we have our virtual tip jar out there as well. Milwaukee Press Club would always appreciate your support. In these unusual times, we can't meet in person like we would at the newsroom pub. And uh, of course, those are events that uh, we do charge for. You get a lunch with that. You get the chance to socially network and do all those fun things that we could do before the pandemic. Well, obviously we can't do that now, but the beauty is we can gather this way, but if you can do anything to help us out financially as we uh, seek help in the support of our mission, both with the Press Club itself and our endowment fund, helping young journalists, just go to milwaukeepressclub.org and you'll see a link there and any contribution would be deeply appreciated. Today, our newsmaker guest is, like you said, the Journal Sentinel's Tom Hardrecord. He has been covering Brewers baseball since 1985. By my count, that's 35 years. He missed a few when he was in New York City covering the Yankees in the early 2000s. He has seen some great baseball. He's seen some bad baseball, but he's seen a lot of Milwaukee baseball for sure. If anybody knows about this ball club. It is Tom Hodricourt. The nation and the state recognize him as well as National Sports Media Association, Wisconsin Sports Writer of the Year in honor. He has won four times, most recently in 2019. He is the author of several books, including a new one on 50 years of Milwaukee Brewers baseball. So without further ado, oh, I should also mention our panelists, Delaney Bry from today's TMJ4 and Drew Olson from 97.3 The Game at iHeartMedia. And now without further ado, Tom Hodricourt, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jason. So uh, we'll talk a few minutes about the book. Uh, if, if people are worried, we're only gonna talk about the book for an hour. Don't hang up yet, don't change the channel. <laughs> we're gonna talk some inside ball, some COVID ball too, something we've never talked about because it's never happened. But you know, I have a copy of my book here handily, you know, uh, turning 50. So let me just say, turning 50 is definitely not my autobiography. That would have a lot of dust on it. Um, so, uh, so no one would, would um, publish a book during a pandemic if they knew the pandemic was coming. <laughs> we didn't have our crystal ball when we started this project, but this is the Brewers' um, 50th anniversary. When Gene just mentioned that I've covered 35 of them, wow, you know, I know they're very tired of me by now and have been for a, a very long time. But um, when we decided to, uh, it would, the, you know, the Brewers, and I feel so sorry for the Brewers because they were going to do many 50th anniversary events this year throughout, spaced out throughout the season, bringing back, you know, players from the past and bobbleheads and just all kinds of stuff. And all of that got shut down by COVID. And even when they, um, you know, start this 60 game season, at least at the start, it sounds like no fans. So their plans got ruined and we'll see what they do about pushing something next year. But um in conjunction with the Journal Sentinel we, and KCI uh, Sports Publishing, we decided to press ahead with the book. And the key was getting the Journal Sentinel on board because that gave us um, access to their vast photo archives. And this is a photo book. Um, it's, a, it's a big book, it's a photo book. Um, I was not able to do like Cosmo Kramer and get them to actually make it a coffee table book that turns into a coffee table. We have no legs on it. Um, but it is a photo book and um, some great photos in there. there. There's a photo in there of an 11 year old Craig Council in his little league uniform holding a trophy flanked by Dion James and I believe Raleigh Fingers. And who knew he'd grow up to be the Brewers manager one day. So a lot of cool old photos in there. Um, I did write the copy we go through and um, you know, decade by decade, five chapters. Uh, did some new interviews with guys from each decade, Ken Sanders from the 70s and Jim Gantner from the 80s, Jeff Cirillo, or as Drew and I know him, the icon uh, from the 90s, um, JJ Hardy from the aughts, the 2000 aughts, and then Ryan Braun from the 2010s. So um, it's doing pretty well. I just saw it's one of the hot new releases from Amazon Books on, on among their baseball releases. 
So you can get it at Amazon, you can get it at KCI Sports Publishing, you can see it, at, find it in stores. I signed a bunch of copies and left them at Boswell Books. So um, no book signings because of COVID, but if you buy a book, I'll figure out a way to get to you and sign it for you, or you come to me or whatever. So we'll work that out. But um, so, uh, so that's enough of the book. Um, but uh, hope, hopefully if you've got it, you've enjoyed it. And if you haven't, you'll get it and we'll enjoy it. And Brewers, uh, they turned 50. They never thought it was going to be like this. So um, we won't talk any uh, more about the book unless my guests want to uh, make comments. But uh, we do want to go on and, and talk about, you know, the Brewers start spring, spring training 2.0 on Saturday at Miller Park or summer camp, whatever you want to call it. We've never had this before, never been training at Miller Park. They've trained in Arizona, somewhere in Arizona, ever since they've been a team, and back to when they were the Seattle Pilots as well. So we've got something new happening, uh, COVID, a lot of COVID protocols. They're doing their testing as we speak during this uh, webinar today. Brewers and all the other teams are doing their COVID testing. Let's hope nothing but negative results, no positives, hopefully. And so uh, off into a brave new world, um, of a 60 game season, gonna be a sprint. We always called it a marathon. Craig Council said not really a sprint, more like a 10K uh, than an actual sprint because you do have 60 games. Let's hope we get through them and get on to October baseball. And so uh, right now, as they, uh, as they start the season on July 24th, everybody's tied for first. What more could you ask? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's gonna be fun. So. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, uh, Delaney and Drew. And uh, let's move on. All right. Well, Tom, I do want to mention the book one last time. And this is just purely because you're a little harsh on bunting. Craig's a little harsh on bunting. I grew up, 1993 is when I was born. My father insists on the bunting. So when I was going through the book, I did find one picture of one man bunting <laughs> in this book. That's and a rare home, photograph. Rare it's photography. 1993. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last time they bunted. <laughs> That's the last, yeah, in the, in the major leagues probably. But you know what? I was a um, natural right-hander, but I, I wasn't very big, obviously. So I had a hard time getting it out of the infield, but I was quick. So they turned me around left, and that's all I did, man, was bunt. I laid it down, and I ran. So um, I am partial to the to the bunting, and I feel like we should still bunt every now and then. I, I But, you know, that's me. I'm old school baseball. Um, and <laughs> I didn't realize this, but I did buy your book at Boswell, so I already have the signature. I oh. got <laughs> Awesome. But well. moving, moving on to... I mean, this is this is one way to celebrate turning 50, I guess, is going through a pandemic, playing a shortened season. What I think will be interesting for major leagues is to truly see if we get to that July 24th opening day, because we have, while there's no minor leagues, um, we have independent baseball. The uh, Green Bay Booyahs are having their first game today. The Milwaukee Milkmen are going to have their first game tomorrow. And they're having it with fans. So while no fans versus fans obviously doubles your chances for contracting COVID with the players and, and with individuals, I think it will be interesting to see how these first couple of weeks go for those individual clubs and possibly how Major League Baseball changes things because of that. No spitting, no spitting. <laughs> I'm not sure how they're going to play without spitting. <laughs> well, the, the finger licking, we joke. But seriously, how many times do you see a pitcher go like that when they're about when they're about to pitch the ball? Dr. Fauci won't like that. No. <laughs> all right, Drew, are you ready yeah. for football? Absolutely, Tom. Um, well, first of all, Delaney, the bunt is dying because the DH is coming to the National League. But in extra innings with a man on second, <laughs> you might see them bunt a guy to third and try to get a sack fly and win the game. Maybe. So that's your exactly. best hope. Wanting in extra innings, which we would never see anyway. But Tom, I'm just I'm just interested. I didn't get to ask you this on the radio yesterday. Is three weeks the perfect length for spring training in a perfect universe? We know that it'll never go shorter because of all the ballparks down in Arizona and Florida that need the revenue. But right. is three weeks enough time 
the guy, the guys say they've been working out. They've been bored. They've been at home. They haven't been able to hit and throw in, in anger like they normally would. Is three yeah. weeks right between now and the 24th? Is that enough time? Is that the perfect amount of time? What do you think? Yeah, the guys have been working out. Brett Suter said he was throwing the baseballs into a sofa cushion. So his wife is so thankful he left so she can sit on the sofa again, put the cushion back. And sit on the sofa. Um, you know what, Drew? And, and you and I saw this as, as uh, the first time we ever partnered up covering the Brewers in 1995. After the strike ended, they came, the real players came back from replacement ball. We could do a 10, new show, 10 shows on replacement ball very close to, uh, to uh, the Three Stooges comedy. Um, and, and they only had three weeks, right? And the hitter said, fine, pitchers not so much. Um, pitchers need more than three weeks. But this is a little different this year because they already had almost a month of spring training back in February and March. And even though it's been three months in between, these guys have been throwing on their own. You know, um, Josh Lindblom and... Um, Brandon Woodruff have been in town pitching, throwing BP at that hitters academy. I know Delaney, the Channel Four, was out there, um, and and so they're up to ninety pitches a session. That's where you would be going into a season. So Craig Council said he was worried about the pitchers getting ready until he checked in with all, and they said, "Yeah, we're bored. Let's go put some hitters in there." So um, I think three weeks will be enough. It's got to fly. fly um, and it's, they're yeah. going to do two workouts a day, though, too, because they got 45 guys and only one field. It's So in 10 days, guys will be complaining about it being too long, and we'll go through the dead arm phase of this summer camp? Well, I promise you I'm going to utter when I get there Saturday, won't spring training ever end. <laughs> <laughs> or summer camp, whatever we're calling it now. <laughs> yeah. I can't get used to summer camp. It just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it's. I don't like it either. <laughs> we have. Um, I don't know how interesting it is um, to our um, viewers and listeners here today about how our jobs are going to change. But we have no player access in person. Um, we can go watch them, but we cannot go on the field or in the clubhouse. Um, in other words, they have us pinned in like they've always wanted all these years. Um, so we're going to go watch from the press box. And then just like today's Milwaukee Press Club webinar, we're going to be Zooming, Zooming with them. So that's going to be different. Um, you know, no personal yeah. interactions, no face-to-face -face, um, interviews, all doing it um, through Zoom. So you literally could do it from your couch at home, which is, you know, always been my desire as an old guy to just stay on the couch. So maybe... <laughs> It's a news director's dream to not spend money and send reporters on the road. But you're right. Baseball is the sport with the most access of any of the major sports. Now they're turning it into an Olympic event where we have kind of like these Zoom mix yeah. zones. And the thing, the beauty about what we did all those years, Tom, was that you stand in the clubhouse. And while we, I'd love to get the hours that I've stood waiting for Richie Sexton and Jeff Jenkins to get out of the shower, like standing in the middle of that room waiting for someone yeah. to come to their locker. I'd love to get that time back in my life. But the casual bump in and the conversations that you have, they inform what you do as a reporter so much. And like, I always made it a point when I was on the beat to talk to every guy every day, if I could. And the, the right. 25th man, at some point he's gonna get in the game, he's either gonna be a hero or he's gonna kick a ball and lose a game. And to have that be the first time you've talked to him in six weeks is a nightmare. So you have to try to do that. And now that's gone. So it, it will yeah. be totally different. Yeah. How much are we gonna miss third base coach Ed Cedar walking oh through, my gosh. seeing us and yelling out, a lot of standing, a lot of standing going on here. He's like the he's like the loitering police. <laughs> you know what though? As much as the, as much of a hard time as they do give us sometimes, um, I think they're gonna miss us a little bit because we like you mentioned, Drew. You know, some of these guys. You know, maybe we wouldn't say they're our best friends because we don't go and have dinner with them or anything. But guys like Corey Knable, for me, you know, I love talking to him. I love talking to Brent Suter. Um, because they're, these are regular human beings at the end of the day. And it's so fun to talk to guys. Corey, for instance, went to Texas. So we have that connection. Chase was the same way. I actually have a friend who went to high school with him. So just to, you know, talk to people like, like that, uh, Chase isn't with the Brewers anymore, but in the past, um, I think they're going to miss us a little bit. And I think they're going to get tired of seeing the same old people over and over. Cause even with traveling and road games you know sure are you gonna 
if you know somebody on the other team, you still have to stand six feet apart and maybe you don't see them other than the nine innings you're playing the ball game. Yeah. Not, not just miss us, Delaney, but they're going to miss each other as far as interactions and tomfoolery. Mm-hmm. You know, I love tomfoolery because it's my name, tomfoolery. I- <laughs> um, but, but, you know, no more pulling chairs together and having a card game. No more, you know, putting an arm around the guy's shoulder and saying what's up with the fam. You know what I mean? They've got to stay six feet apart. They're going to use both clubhouses or summer camp visiting and home to spread the guys out even more. So the clubhouse is a beehive of social behavior, right? Uh, whether we're in there or not, I think more so when we're out of there, because then they <laughs> can do whatever they want. But um, they're, they're not going to be able to do that. Uh, they're they're going to be wearing masks, I think, when they're off the field. Um, so they're going to live a whole different life. And the clubhouse is you know, not going to be like it used to be where it's like a little, almost a fraternity mm-hmm. part there you know the guys cutting up and having fun and and you remember the little kids used to run around too that's out yeah. that's out no no yeah. children you know, what's lorenzo Cain gonna do without his three kids hanging on him when he in does interviews you know what <laughs> we, we used to we used to go talk to low not not just to hear what he had to say but just to what he becomes a a, a monkey bar you know he like, yeah. <laughs> his kids start climbing around his neck on his head and you know and um, that that led to the um, that led to the famous thing. Um, I'm Lorenzo Cain. I'm old, and I have three kids. You know, because he just talks about. We always talk about he rope dopes everybody walking so slow, and he says, "I got three kids." So, you know, I walk. You know, they're, I'm slow because of them. So, and they also used to run around in identical three identical onesies. <laughs> so you knew they were all together. <laughs> so yeah, we saw I mean, Prince I think kids grow up. Tom, that's the best Everybody's part about the clubhouse. We, we saw Prince Fielder's kids grow up. You and I saw Jose Valentin's little kid at about two years old swing a wiffle bat. We said, that kid's going to play professional baseball. Some, and sure enough, he is. He, he made it to the, to the pros. He made it to the minor leagues. I mean, you can uh, – Yeah. Having that around I think the Brewers have already the signed – I think the Brewers have already signed Hernan Perez's five-year-old son because he was <laughs> – I'll tell you one thing, G. When when we used to go in the clubhouse, uh, Drew and I, we used, you almost have used to have to wear a cup because those kids were zinging balls in there. <laughs> you were really worried about taking one to the groinage area in there because uh, <laughs> those kids had no fear, man, and they were running around. So it's um the social aspect of baseball is gonna almost just disappear for this year you got you know we're talking 60 games but still these guys are going to miss those social interactions and a lot of them are just have left their families at home too so they're not even going to see them except for zooming with them so they're about to go into um a whole new world i was looking at the um covid protocols on the road um basically the players will not be able to leave their hotel rooms except to go play the games uh, all food's got to come to them. No restaurants. Not, no, not you can't go to the hotel fitness room or restaurant. No, you know, I don't know if they're gonna have hall monitors like like in summer camp, real summer camp or what. But um, these guys are gonna be in a bubble because they're, oh. they're afraid of COVID and they should be. You know, we we don't know what the tolerance level is gonna be for mo- how many guys can get sick and they'll keep playing. Like, is it? guys is it six is it four is it seven you know they won't answer those questions they were yeah, the taxi baseball, squad in appleton but i think baseball maybe has going for them though in, in that respect of how many guys can get sick and when we asked craig this when we talked to him last week you know as far as the mixtures of those groups because there's been a lot of talk with the nfl that if one guy gets covid the way that they practice and they are truly in units you could take out your entire O-line if one guy yes. gets COVID and you don't catch it fast enough. Right. But what I think baseball maybe has, you know, a little bit of defense against that is they are in different groups. You've got infielders and outfielders and pitchers, you know, in a group over here working out. And then you've got another mixture over here working out. And you've also got a lot of guys, you know, the Brewers love utility players. You got a lot of guys who can play different positions. So that may yeah. be one thing that they have going for them if they can't catch someone who's asymptomatic, who is positive before he has, you know, two or three workouts with the team. Right. 
Right. Yeah. You know, what what every team is fearful of is that their best guy gets it. If Yelich gets it, yeah. and he has to be away for ten days. That's not ten out of one sixty two like it used to be. It's ten yeah. out of sixty. So so Drew, uh, they're they're preaching a responsibility to these guys that you can't. You're you're not just responsible for yourself anymore. You're responsible for your teammates. If you well, break rules and you get infected, and then you go and infect a whole bunch of other guys, you're going to damage your team. So they're pre, and, and that's kind of the way you're supposed to be teammates anyway, one for all and all for one, but never more so than this year, don't you think? Well, what'll be interesting, Tom, is that we've seen the evolution. When you started covering the Brewers in the mid 80s, players would show up kind of on the media bus. They'd get to the ballpark at four o'clock for a seven o'clock game. And as, a, as the culture of the, the sport has evolved, now guys get there at noon and they eat yes. their, they basically eat two meals a day at the ballpark anyway. So on the road, if guys, if, if you play a road game and you end at, at 1030 at night and guys get to, let's say they get to bed because they're not supposed to go out anywhere at midnight or one o'clock and they might sleep till 10, 11, they're going to go right to the ball, but they're going to spend most of their off time on the road, not in the hotel room, but at the ballpark. Right. And in a way, it's not, that's not going to be that radical because a lot of them are there anyway. And I always ask like, what are they doing? What do you, what, what do you do at, at noon? Like, you know, crossword puzzles, they have nice lounges. That's why these clubhouses are so nice. But yes. it'll change now, and the guys are yeah. going to have to – And so, but the, the, the bad part of that, and Delaney mentioned it, they're going to be together in that environment rather than isolated. So I'll be interested to see, and I haven't seen any rules on this yet, what time can visiting teams arrive at work and get to the clubhouse? Do they have well, to they do that at, time? They, well, they, they do have rules. It's in the manual. I want to say four hours. Um, ah, see? But here's the key – they want them out an hour and a half after the final out. Want them out of the ballpark at night. Good thing and, Trevor Hoffman retired. Yeah, yeah the, the media has been told out uh, after the last Zoom, you got one hour to go. So to use a baseball term, I've been working on my exit velocity. <laughs> right fast and be We're going to have to get some scooters for the media, like the ball players mm -hmm. have. <laughs> no kid. A couple of years ago, when I was on crutches with my leg thing, I would have had no chance. <laughs> no chance whatsoever. I mean, we're going in different entrances, going right to the press box. You're pretty much locked in there. No media dining. No Lorraine. No. God sakes, no Lorraine. Um, the one that serves us our food. Um, you know, you're you're basically just staying. I, I got. I've, uh, I'm. I am not kidding. And you two guys should think. Uh, tell me if you're equipped in this regard. I don't have a pair of binoculars. I got to go get some because I think we're going to need them for the first time. Do you nope. have? I got to get some too. Yeah. I know TVV because has some though. Shout out to TVV. He's got some. <laughs> I give him a hard time because I'm like, man, you got to clean those. I should get a little dust. Yeah. <laughs> I'm suspect of any guy that has binoculars. I wouldn't have been of you, Delaney. <laughs> <laughs> Just a yeah. telescope. Um, as long as you're not stealing but, signs with them. Yeah, but right? seriously, yeah, but seriously, we're gonna, you know, the guys that aren't in the game are gonna be wearing masks. I asked uh, Mike Vasallo, media relations director, if they could wear their number on their mask so we could identify them. <laughs> from the not from a bad the idea. Hey. He said no. Welcome to welcome to my life when I have to cover the Packers and it's uh it's rookie camp and everybody's in either green or yellow with no numbers and they've got a helmet on and you're trying to figure out who these guys are. I know, gosh, no kidding. So who? But literally, who are these masked men? We're going to be asked, who are these masked men? You know, so uh, it's it's going to be interesting. It's going to be so fascinating for them. What do you? Have you guys thought much about the no fans thing? Because Craig Council's a little spooked by that. Um, he does not think players understand yeah. how different that's going to well. be because those guys get a lot of their juice uh, from the fans. Like when you have a rally going at home and your fans are standing up, and I mean, it, it gets the hair up on the back of your neck, and it also intimidates the other team. Um, now, you know, unless they're going to pipe in, you know, some crowd noise, which some teams are doing like in Korea and Taiwan and stuff like that. They're putting like dummies in the stands too, but let's not even go. I'm setting us up for two yeah. dummies in the stands, you know, cause we already got it in the press box, but I'm bum. Um, the, so, um, the no fans thing, Tom, it's the biggest adjustment. Craig is right. The 60 game season is obviously the most stark thing. Cause it's, you said it's the 10 K. Okay. It's a, to me, it's a sprint. It's a two month sprint. Like imagine opening day to Memorial day, but the no fans thing, you're right. 
Christian Yelich at least got used to playing in front of very few fans in Miami, so it's not as big an adjustment. But a lot of these guys haven't played in small confines like that since maybe college or the Arizona Fall League. And to be able to, to motivate yourself, because you hear Craig every once in a while use the, the, the term entertainers. They are yes. entertainers. Sports yes. is entertainment, and they're entertainment, and they draw from the crowd, and there's that, that cycle that you're talking about when things happen and when, you know, when rallies get going and when there's momentum and big moments in games, and especially in playoff games it will be different for those guys. And I think other than like, you can, we can point to the DH and we can point to the extra inning rules and everything like that. But the no crowd thing is absolutely going to be uh, prevalent. It's going to be the biggest thing that they have to, that we as fans and viewers have to get used to and that the players are going to have to get used to. It's going to be the most jarring thing, I think. No, absolutely. And I agree. I try. And now of course I never played a professional sport in my life, but I grew up playing in high school and college. And I tried to think about, what that would be like with no fans. And I mean, even, even then when you're an athlete, you know, think about a, a no-no from Lorenzo Cain, you know, diving on the wall, snagging a home run out of the air, you know, he, whether they admit it or not, they hear that noise and they feed off of that. Like Drew said, and I couldn't imagine playing in a game where there is nobody watching me. Now yeah, you get a yeah. you get a little bit of sense of that, like Drew said, when you're you're in college or you're in the summer ball because you're playing at tournaments and you know there's five different fields and people are spread out and sporadic, but you still know somebody's there. You know, when you're trying to get recruited, you still know somebody's there watching you. Yeah, and they're not yeah. even going to have that realization of seeing a scout or or seeing a fan walk by and be like oh i'm being watched and yeah. i think that's part of the game too you you play yeah. it because you love it but yeah. let's be honest we all we all like to have that moment of hitting a ball hitting a home run throwing somebody out it is almost as an instant approval when you hear the fans cheering and they're not going to have that I know, I know. I asked Craig Council on a recent zoom if he was going to miss the heckling when he doesn't take a picture out quick enough <laughs> <laughs> He said, he said I, no, but I think he will. Yeah, I said, I'll be happy to yell at you from the press box. You know? oh. um. <laughs> so, so that was one, that was one thing, uh, you know, in a, in a professional press box, we're not allowed to cheer. We're not allowed to gasp. We're not allowed to, to show uh -huh. any bias, but I think this year, if we see something spectacular, I think they should let us do it. <laughs> 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 especially since there won't be any road media it'll just be the home media <laughs> exactly right yeah and um there's only one team that's happy there's going to be no fans this year the houston Astros. they were going to be booed everywhere they went for cheap oh i knew that was coming <laughs> <laughs> remember I'm, when I'm we a thought texas ranger fan at heart but i yeah. i gotta admit the texas rangers broke my heart twice when they went to the world series and they didn't win it uh, while I was alive, and so when yeah. the Astros won it, I was pretty proud. But it's it's a hard one. It's well, <laughs> just like the Brewers and uh, the uh, NLCS in 2011, they couldn't get David Freeze out. The uh, Rangers couldn't get David Freeze out. Brewers really? couldn't get David Freeze out either. That guy tormented the heck out of them. So uh, yeah, so I mean, it's it's just you know I know we're not going to get to talk to people like we used to, but it's still going to be fascinating to chronicle this because of all. Yeah things we just said i mean we've never seen anything like this and uh and who knows how it's going to be they don't know how it's going to be you know it's right the 13 page manual and they will be tested on it they said there'd be no math but they will be tested <laughs> you know on that and so uh it's um you know and if guys get covid i don't even think they have to tell us you know it's like if a guy's in out of the lineup tonight is it does he have covid or is he just getting rested you know mm -hmm. and so um that's a good question. Fascinating, fascinating things. I, I don't know what's going to happen the next uh, three months, but I do think we'll be talking about it the rest of our lives. For sure. Tom, one of the things that happened yesterday, we mentioned on the radio that uh, the minor leagues are now officially, we knew back in March, basically, that they weren't going to play fanless minor league games and that those were going to yeah. go away. But what does this mean? Because they were already talking about contracting. What does this mean for the future of minor league baseball and, and the system where the clubs have been supporting, you know, as many clubs as uh, farm clubs as they have. Yeah. Um, I, my, I, I started covering baseball with minor league baseball, the class, uh, triple a Richmond Braves and Richmond, Virginia. I know Delaney just mentioned going to minor league games. Anyone 
who has lived in a community that has a minor league baseball team can tell you how important that team is to that community in the summer. A lot of times it's the best thing to do, especially if you have children, because you go out there, the tickets are not expensive. The food's not expensive. They promote, they, these people know how to promote. They know how to promote. Here, here's an example. Um, you know, minor league teams love to do weird logos. And so I came up with this COVID hat, a baseball wearing a mask. Well, this is the actual logo of the Quad Cities River Bandits. Um, but man, a baseball. I, I predict their franchise stays afloat merely uh, this year, merely by these hats. <laughs> have no games. Um, yeah, so we lost what two minor league teams in Wisconsin, right? The Appleton, uh, the uh, Wisconsin Timber Rattlers, who are a Brewers farm affiliate, and then Beloit, uh, the Beloit's team also. I think they're with uh, I want to say Oakland now, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So um, yeah, so those you know, and, but we knew it was going to happen, guys, because uh, once we knew fans would not be able to come to games, the minors were done. You know, they, they're all they they're all about fans. They that's where they make all their money from. They don't have these big radio TV contracts and all this national money. It's fans is what makes them survive. So there's 160 affiliated minor league teams as we speak today. Most people think there won't even there won't be more than a hundred next year still in existence because some will get contracted by MLB who wants to sort of uh, narrow the pool a little bit. And others are just going to go out of business. They just not, unless they get government loans or local loans or something. These people work on very small financial margins. So not only are, you know, hundreds of players have no place to play, uh, those cities have no baseball teams. All those people that work, you know, everybody in a small community knows Joe the usher and Fred the hot dog vendor and the guy that meets them in the parking lot. These these guys are family friends, can, you know. So it, it's tough. I, I I have a real affinity for minor league baseball just from covering it in the uh, at the start of my career, and it's just baseball in its purest form. They're not worried about labor negotiations, contracts, all that stuff. They're just out there playing. Most of them know they're never going to the major leagues, but there's a chance they might. Mm -hmm. Just putting that uniform on means something to them. That was a dark day for baseball yesterday, and we'll see the re repercussions of that for many years to come. I, well, just, the, the, the draft too, Tom. You know, the, yes. this year's draft, uh, that, that affects how these guys would be playing. Yeah, five, five rounds. rounds too. That affects college. Delaney, like the, the kids who would have gone in the draft go back to college and then the incoming freshmen get bumped and that impacts recruiting. It impacts, you know, the, it shakes all the way down through the throughout baseball. I, I was going to say, I just think, I think not having the minor league season is going to hurt baseball than we thought these negotiations were going to hurt baseball, honestly, because baseball already has this stigma of why, if I play football and I play baseball and I'm equally as talented in both of them, why would I pick baseball over football? I can make a lot more money faster. I can get into the pros a lot faster. You know, a lot of people don't realize that these guys that get drafted, like Tom said, some of them play in the minors and that is their professional career is playing in the minors. They never make it to the MLB, but they do it because they love the game and there's always that chance that they might get there. And with, if it really goes from 160 to a hundred minor league teams, that to me, that is more devastating than whatever professional negotiations could happen between the MLB and, and the players union. Um, yeah. Because that is going to take, it's going to crush so many dreams and it's going to make the possibility of becoming a major league baseball player that much harder. And yes. once people realize that it gets that, it's going to be that harder, you're going to see a lot more kids say, well, I'll stay in college and get my degree and then I'll go be in business or I'll go be in advertising or communications, yeah. you know, whatever it is, because, and also to mention, like Tom said, these are a lot of people who, who work. These are a lot of people's jobs to put it in perspective. Uh, I believe when COVID first started, they were saying that teams were playing minor league players $500 a week. Now we don't make as much money as people think we do in this business, but I make more than $500 a week. And, and, and Delaney, and I think crazy. actually, I think actually 400. Was it 400? So then, yeah. I mean, $400 a week is what a minor league baseball player makes. You don't get, you know, yes, you see these first round draft. I, I think the 
number one overall pick just signed for like four or five million. That's one person. Right. <laughs> that's that's, that's right. one person that maybe gets that. And, and that may be all the money he makes. He may never make it to the majors and get another contract. Right. That may be yeah. it. Yeah. And five yeah. million for a year, I mean, or for, you know, your years and your life, you think, oh, I could live off that. But yeah. you can't. Yeah. <laughs> you really can't. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the crushing the dreams thing that you said, Delaney, that's the key. It crushes dreams. And man, that's important for young kids because a lot of them know they're not going to go to the major leagues. But if you play in the pros, you're a professional baseball player. You know, look at me. I'm a professional baseball player. Not very many of them get to do that. And that's, uh, that, that's rough. And like you said, and just from those figures you, we were just talking about, they're not doing it for the money, you know. Those top draft picks are getting some, but the major, the ninety five percent are not getting it. So <laughs> that signing stuff reminds me so much of one of Euchre's favorite stories. He said, talks about when he signed with the Milwaukee Braves. He goes, "Yeah, I, I, it was a three thousand dollar bonus, and that was hard on my family. We didn't have that kind of money." <laughs> <laughs> So Bob, he had to pay hey, let's, let's mention, <laughs> let's mention how cool it is. He's there. Look at that. <laughs> there he is. God, he's just the best. I've got a crazy picture of him here somewhere. Um, I think he should go back to wearing the uniform. Look at this one. The old, remember when he used to wear the Kooji sweaters? Oh yeah. That's a good picture. Yeah. <laughs> Autograph too. That was the cover um, of the media guide one year. Yes. Yeah, it was. So Sorry for being off. Uh, I got off frame there. I'm going to get yelled at by the production crew. Um, the you know so let's mention that though. That's big. That Euchre pretty much at his insistence is going to do the home games. You know he hasn't traveled on the road for several years, um, with a few exceptions anyway. But he's going to do the 30 home games from Miller Park. He was he was given the opportunity to do it from home. They would set up a studio there you know, in Menominee Falls, your old stomping grounds, Drew. And, um, and he was, because and, and, he's 86 years old and he's had more surgeries than we want, we want to know. He's a definite COVID risk, but he would have none of that, none of that. And so he said, I'm coming out there. And, and so I, I heard, I know they're going to protect him. You know, the old bullpen cart that had like the baseball cap on it. I think they're enclosing it in plexiglass and he's going to get his own Pope mobile. Uh, and they're just going to drive him from the parking lot up, up the ramps to the press box. Well, and I was going to say, he already oh. drives his, his sports cars into the bay. I mean, how much closer can you get? I know. And if it would, if it would go up the ramps, he'd take it all the way to the press box, I think. So, um, but you know what? He's a national treasure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody has told me summer's so different this year. And, and as we all know, summer got canceled in Milwaukee. Every stinking thing we love about summer in Milwaukee has been canceled. But somebody said the one thing that they missed is sitting out in their driveway or doing the lawn with your headset on and listening to Bob Euchre do a game. It's literally the sound of summer mm -hmm. in Milwaukee and, and throughout Wisconsin on their network. And somebody said they haven't missed anything as much as they've missed that. So that's, you know, that's going to be cool that for 30 games, he gets to do that. And so thank God he's 86 years old, you know, and uh, he says he's going to, I love it. He thought when um, Harry Callis of the Phillies actually died in the booth a few years ago, he said, that guy's my idol. That's how I want to go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so he calls it his dirt bath. He goes, uh, I want to go in the booth and take me right to my dirt bath. Um, so uh, he, uh, he was asked if he was afraid of catching COVID. And he said, I led the major leagues in past balls when I was a catcher. I can't catch anything. Love it. <laughs> it's going to be a change for him, Tom, because he, he interacts with the players. Like the players consider him one, a part of the team. Yes. And for him not to be on that, on the planes and, uh, on the road and in the clubhouse and even around the batting cage, that's going to be different for them too. They've got to get him one of those. Like if we, if we stuck a laptop on a robot, we got to get him one of those so he can just go around and still talk to the players. But, you know, I mean, Yuke is, Yuke is great. And he's one of those people to where you may have never met him before, but when you're at the ballpark and when you're in that atmosphere and he knows you're in his environment, I, he's so friendly. I, I know he probably couldn't tell me from Adam or Eve, but every time I see him, he smiles and says hello. 
And, um, you know, and I've, I've only been at the ballpark, not nearly as long as, as both of you have. So yeah. he's, he's a kind person, a kind individual, and I'm glad he's going to be able to get to do what he loves. Um, because that, I mean, think of the fans, they've, they've had something taken away that they, they love, they love going yes. to the ballpark and watching. So to know that he's still going to be able to do that. And I think that will help. I think that will help for people to be able to listen to him and, um, we were joking about this yesterday, Tom, but maybe they should, since they're not going to have noise or they're not going to have fans, maybe they should put Uke in the, in the dugout so that the players can at least hear him. That'd be great, wouldn't it? His broadcast just over the PA. Guys would definitely stop playing, though, because they would just want to listen to him. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he stole the movie Major League, and he, st- and he steals uh, just about every broadcast, too. He has two great guys working with him. Uh, Jeff Levering and Lane Grinnell and Drew and our old buddy, uh, Kent Sommerfeld is he's been there as long as you almost. And so, uh, yeah, so it's not, we've just talked about all the things that won't be the same and it's almost everything, but at least you on the radio, that'll be the same. And we've got to have some normalcy. We don't have much of it. So Mr. Miller, how are we doing for time here? Uh, we, uh, can we, should we take yeah. We're doing terrific. I've yeah. got a few questions from the audience. If you want, I can work those in. And uh, first off, uh, somebody wants to know right off the bat, we haven't really addressed this yet, but we don't know what the team is going to really look like. I think we have a fairly good idea, but uh, Mike wants to know, how are the Brewers going to do this year in the short schedule? What do we think? Well, let's, let's pick the team from uh, our panel. Let's, well, all right, catch, I'll start catcher, Omar Nevarez, and um, the backup will be Manny Pena. Delaney, what about first base? And that's changed. The pitcher has the come on, you know yeah. what first base is. The, yeah. the pitcher has changed. I, I know, but I well, we thought Ra- we DH thought Ryan now. Braun, right? We thought Ryan Braun was gonna place a lot of first base. Now we got the DH. That's that's what I was gonna say. It's it was so an or, don't you think it, before the DH, but now yeah. you you don't know. I mean, don't you think Justin Smoke's gonna see most oh. of them in there, or do you have a do you have, do you have a like a backup you, that you think will steal time away from Smoke? You know what? It, this is gonna sound crazy, but in a perfect world, just because God, I love him and I hope he makes the team and I hope we fit him in somewhere. I hope Keon Broxton learns how to play first base. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I He's really, paid. I really do. Just, I mean, I love that. Yeah. I love that guy, and he is. Such- He's got the. Uh, he's got the um, wingspan for it. What about? He is. He's got a good wingspan, yeah. and he can do the splits. He can. Yeah. I mean, he's a yeah. lengthy guy. What about your fellow Texan, Brock Holt? Um, uh, Brock could definitely be a, be a good first baseman. Um, I I still think it's all going to come down with who gets who gets hot because I still think he, Ryan Braun has a very good chance of playing first base if somebody yeah. else gets hot in that DH position yeah. and and Ryan's doing well now if. If we're looking at the lineup and nobody's really hot, that's going to be a position where I think Craig constantly switches out the DH to see who right. he can get hot and who he can get going. Right. Um, right. But if Ryan Braun comes out of the gate, whether that's playing right field or right, playing first base, and he's doing well, I right. think he's I think he stays there and you bring somebody else in the DH to see how you yeah. can help yourself out yeah. the most. Because at the end yeah. of the day, you know, we say pitching wins championships in baseball, but I think in a 60-game stretch, it truly is going to be that lineup and how fast and how quickly you can start scoring runs and stringing hits together. Right. I think that's something that's good for the Brewers because we've, we've seen that, yes, they get hot in, in September and they get hot, you know, at that last stretch, but they're pretty good at the beginning of the season as well. It's, it's the yes. middle and the all-star break where we start freaking out a little bit and then they find a way to get hot again before the playoffs. Yeah, I want to say they were 36 and 24 of the first 60 games last year, and that was first place. So I'm not going to give you a second base because if you didn't say Keston Hero, we would do a <laughs> check on you. Yeah, we're riot. <laughs> um, so left side of the infield, um, we've got we've got something in play that we didn't have in spring training 1.0, a healthy Luis Urias. Yeah, that he's a factor, and Orlando RC is hot spring relatively speaking right his hot start to the spring is erased now and we don't know and that's still there's still some questions there but the depth of this team and the offense and you just getting back to the first base dh thing the fact that they have the dh the brewers in the past when when they would go play interleague it's like well who's going to dh well they didn't have a lot of options now they have a lot of options obviously bronze option one 
if Logan Morrison is that guy or somebody else, or they can rotate one of the guys, one of the outfielders who needs a day off, uh, you know, whether it's Garcia, Kane, or maybe even Yelich, get him a day off his leg. They have so yeah, many Yelich. more options. They have so many more options. And it's funny because in the past, that has hamstrung the Brewers, not having the DH. Remember Doug Melvin, he tried to get Raul Banyas for like five years in a row and couldn't guarantee him at bats because they didn't have the DH spot. And it was right. it hampered them in free agency to get guys. This might extend Ryan Braun's career if there's a DH next year. And it just it opens things up. And they have a team. The construct of the team, though they've been in the National League, is this year better suited to the DH than I think it's been in the last, you know, since Prince Fielder yeah. and those guys left. So somebody, somebody told me that they, well, we won't see Brandon Woodard, Woodruff hit a home run off Clayton Kershaw ever again. I said, yeah, and you won't see Jimmy Nelson diving back in the first base and blowing out his shoulder and ruining his career either. You know, so oh, yeah. there's a lot yeah, to be said for that. So, so that's taking us around yeah. the infield. The outfield, if it's not that's Yelich done. in left, Kane in center, and Avisel Garcia in right, Craig Council will be fired before game one, I predict, when in the lineup card comes out. So that's Absolutely. the outfield. The pitching, Gene, um, you know, we know four starting spots, I think, pretty good. I think we know we've got Brandon Woodruff, we've got Josh Lindblom, Brett Anderson, and Adrian Hauser. And so if they do go with five, and who knows, in this crazy season, they may use more. You've got Freddie Peralta, Corbin Burns, and uh, now healthy Eric Lauer, who was hurt at the end of the original camp, but now healthy. You know, the one silver lining is all, they had like five guys heading for the DL at the end of the first spring training, and now they're all healthy, including Corey Knable, who's the wild card on the whole pitching staff. Delaney was talking about her Texas buddy, Corey. You know, he's coming off Tommy John surgery. He was going to miss the first two months of the season. Well, those months have gone by now. He didn't get his minor league rehab, but he's healthy. So if he, I can't see them not keeping him. What are they going to do? Assign him to Camp Appleton? I just don't see it. The uh, only thing I worry, the only thing I worry with Corey is because even if he would have missed those two months when you have 162 games, you know they would have had so much more time to slowly integrate him. Right. And, and that's that's my biggest fear is with this 60 games, they either don't have that time or there's a situation to where they need to win a ball game and he's the only one available and you have that. That's just my biggest fear. But yeah, I know but that I, the Brewers and councils and, do so well they, with workload. Right. And they will have to be careful with that. But, but having at 16 or 17 pitchers, We'll give them the leeway to ease Corey in it. They're not going to risk Corey Canable's future. This guy is so good, he, you know, but he is, um, and I know Delaney's got the number, well, he's a competitive son of a gun. So <laughs> if they've got him out there, he's going to try to throw a hundred miles an hour. So I just have to be careful with him. And you do, but you do have the three batter rule this, you know, this year, you got to face at least three batters to, get to the end of the inning. So they might bring him in a couple of times with two outs where he can just get the one out and be done with the inning. Then if they don't want to send them back out there, they don't have to, you know? So, but they'll, uh, yeah, they'll, uh, they'll be careful with Corey, but um, he's champing at the bit, man. He wants, <laughs> he wants to go play. And another guy, Gene, I want to throw his name out there. Um, Todd Rosiak had a great story about him in the paper this morning because he's coming here from California in an RV, Drew <laughs> Um, I heard that in the world of COVID, RV sales have, you know, gone crazy, which is great because I've never actually seen one sell, um, but <laughs> apparently they're selling like Lisa Douglas's hots cakes in Green Acres. There's my old guy reference, Todd Rose, more old guy references. I said, I'm an old guy. What do you expect? But anyway, Drew Asmus said, who can throw a hundred? We saw him do it. I saw the gun with three numbers on it, not two. Um, he's coming from California, no, excuse me, from Oregon, where he lives, in an RV, and he's just going, I don't know, he's, he might park it out in the Miller parking lot, Miller Park parking lot. <laughs> no fans can come, he might as well make it an RV camp. That's, know, do they have, do they have well, the that's what we got, Gene. Uh, what, what else you got for yeah. us? Well, uh, we, we haven't talked about the, the real ugly side of this uh, offseason, this, this hiatus that we have been on since uh, the first incarnation of spring training, and that is the negotiations between the owners and the players that went absolutely nowhere spinning of the wheels, the, uh, the ugliness of millionaires and billionaires arguing at a time when people are trying to find two nickels to scratch together. Such a lost opportunity for the game. Uh, but there's going to be obviously a, a long-term impact. You got a new collective bargaining agreement. You got to wonder too, I guess, if, if the owners are using this to get the, the money players at the top of the pay scale and the 
players at the bottom of the pay scale kind of against each other, almost, you know, get a split in the union, get that chasm going. I don't know if that's just my conspiratorial mind at work there, but what do you folks think about what you saw this off season and, and the ugliness between players, union members and, and the owners? Well, I think the most discouraging thing out of all that for those of us who love the game and want to see baseball do well is that the, the players and owners do not act like they're on the same side. You know, they're supposed to be rowing in the same direction and, and making this sport better. They talk about growing the game all the time. Well, this year they shrunk it by arguing, you know. And so, um, and we do have a new CBA coming up after next year. And if they're going to fight over money during a pandemic, what are they going to do uh, in a, with CBA? Actually break out weapons and start shooting? Um, I mean... It's the, we've got that dark cloud going to hang over us till the, there's a new CBA. You know, we under Bud Selig, they finally stopped the BS after 94, 95 and never had another work stoppage. But a lot of people think that streak's going to end next year. We kind of had a work stoppage this year when they let some months go by that they could have been playing. Um, yeah, it's the never ending thing. Players want more money, owners don't want to pay them as much money, you know. so. To, to simplify what happened this year was the agreement that they reached in March, which they later didn't agree on what they agreed on, um, which is pretty interesting with lawyers involved. Uh, players get most of their money in the regular season. So they wanted to play as many regular season games as they could prorated pay. You know, the more games, the more money they make owners get a big chunk of their money. Well, especially with no fans, with no fans in the stands, the owners were going to get almost all of their money in postseason revenue, right? national TV and radio contracts. So they just wanted to get to the postseason and play as few games as possible beforehand. So players wanted more games, owners wanted fewer games, but October baseball, and thus the fight began. And that's why I went for so long and why we only have 60 games. Now, in the meantime, COVID has flared up pretty bad. And I think we'll be lucky to get 60 games. Um, so maybe that was for the best. But, um, you know, there might be grievances still filed for this. And, yeah, um, this offseason will be interesting, Tom, because the owners can cry poor and it'll depress free agent salaries even more than the players are already suspicious because, you know, Bryce Harper and Manny Machado had to wait a long time for their big deals and everything. So the players are already thinking that the, there was collusion. Now it's going to be COVID collusion. And yeah. people are, you know, that there's so much mistrust between the sides that um, they're going to have to negotiate almost every day between now and the end of the next agreement to come even close. So uh, I, I, it's not hopeful for them when, when the game is on the field and we're watching the game, we're talking about pitching matchups and hitters and stuff is great. But when we talk about the labor stuff, it gets so ugly so fast. I was going to say, I think this is the one and only time you can say loyalty is is the biggest weakness here because the players union and the players are so loyal to each other. I think they're one of the strongest unions in, in professional athletics and Pro the probably in business, are. probably and in all of business, the best, the strongest union anywhere, sports Delaney, even beyond sports, there's a lot of steel workers and, you know, car, car auto workers who'd like a union like this one. Absolutely. But the problem is, is the owners are the same way. And um, the owners have a commissioner who, in my mind, again, I'm 27 years old. I haven't been around that long. But for me, as a, as a younger fan looking at this game and someone who grew up watching baseball, this, this was a moment where the commissioner kind of said, you know what, the owners are more important to me than the players. Because yeah. Well, he works for them. You know, he does work, they do pay him. They do yeah. pay him. But yeah. in, I think in order, and that's maybe one of the problems, is you even see, you know, Roger Goodell and Adam Silver. Now, now Adam Silver, I wish he could control baseball because he's someone who is very, very good at, at playing both sides. But even yeah. Roger has his moments where you can tell he puts the players first. And I just feel like this was a situation to where um, he, it was very black and white where the allegiance was. And I think that's why the players have that mistrust. And uh, yeah. it's, it's unfortunate because it, it hurts the game. A game that, quite frankly, you know, we give... I'm from Texas, so we give soccer a hard time. Like, who watches soccer? Probably a lot more people care about soccer than they than they do baseball right now, and and that's eye opening. 
Yeah, it did. Um, it did turn off a lot of fans to see this haggling during a pandemic when you've lost your job because of COVID. You really don't want to see these people arguing over money. So uh, a baseball uh, person uh, put it this way to me the other day, and I thought it really summarized where the game is right now. He said, we're going to play this year with the cloud of COVID over us. We're going to play next year with the cloud of the new CBA negotiations over us. He said, so we all need to get the 2022 and see where the game is and what's left of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so that's really not a healthy atmosphere yep. to be playing under is, to, you know, I mean, COVID, that's daunting enough, but next year, if all they're worried about is establishing negotiating positions for the new CBA, you know, we're, it's, like I said, we're supposed to be growing the game. These guys are supposed to be on the same side, you know, so, um, all I know is we didn't. We're not going to get to see enough of Kristen Yelich this year. You know, you you've got great players. You don't want to see sixty games. You want to see, you know, more than that. So, uh, yeah, let's see where we are in twenty twenty two. So I'm, I hope on, on you know like Euchre says about the dirt bath. That's my goal, uh, just to get the twenty twenty two. Let's wrap it up on a light note. Favorite baseball movie: Tom Hardcourt. Oh, uh, you guys are going to laugh at me. It's so corny. It's good. The natural. I, I just, and, and it has a lot to do with Wilfred Brimley getting a drink from a fountain in the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> just go back and listen to that line. But uh, it's just so corny. It's good. But, but I mean, major league to me is like you know, on a different level. So out of non-major, out of movies, not called major league, for the aforementioned Mr. Euchre, and not to mention Pete Vukovic playing Clue Hayward. Um, I'll go with the natural. What okay. do you think, Laney? Well, today is a League of Their Own's birthday. So I, I, love, a, I love a good League of the Own. Um, I couldn't probably tell you how many times I've said there's no crying in baseball. And um, another line from that movie that's a little more inappropriate. <laughs> uh, a line that was said to an umpire. Uh, oh, okay. Movie. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know uh, what, though? You know what, though, Delaney? If a movie gives one catchphrase that um that lives forevermore, like The Godfather with making an offer you can't refuse, that no crying in baseball, it, it that became a huge saying. Yep, it did. And, uh, yeah. you know, one one of my favorite movies of all time that not a lot of people, it's, it's not your you know, typical sports movie, you know, it's no miracle or anything like that. But um, if you guys have never seen Hardball with Keanu Reeves, you guys got to watch Hardball. It's an old, it made in the 2000s. Um, that is one of my favorite movies. And it's about baseball. It's about a guy who coaches an inner inner city league um, because he has a gambling problem and he's getting paid to coach the league. And um, I, right. I love it. I love it. It's All a great movie. What do you got, Drew? I know Tom that you like the natural because you uh, you associate yourself with Max Mercy for the Robert <laughs> character. But um, for me, it's, it's Full Durham's my my favorite. That's the go to. I um I do a lot of radio segments about how much I dislike uh, Field of Dreams. All due respect yeah. to people in Iowa, but I don't like that movie. I don't think it's a baseball movie. I don't think it's a good movie at all. But Full Durham to me is almost a perfect baseball movie because of the stuff that you see. Uh, between the lines it's just it's fantastic so that to me is number one so, and it just had what it's 40th anniversary is that right yeah i think that. so yeah yeah i'll still laugh every time that mascot gets drilled by the by uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> and the other stuff too we talk about inappropriate yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was the that was probably the best uh depictation of uh minor league baseball ever full durham yeah, by far. Very good stuff. Well, guys, thank you so much for taking part today. Tom Hodricourt, one more time, give your book a plug. Um, what's the name of my book? Where is it? I'm about 50 years. A whole lot of baseball. <laughs> Turning 50, the Brewers celebrate a half century in Milwaukee. Uh, get it for the photos and just try to put up with the copy by me. <laughs> <laughs> You are too modest. The photos are great, but the copy is even better. And check out all of Tom's books on Brewers baseball. He uh, he has lived it all and seen it all, and he, he, we're lucky that he is able to chronicle it for us moving forward. Tom, thank you so much. Thanks as well to Delaney Bry of today's TMJ4. Drew Olson from 97.3, the game at iHeart. 
Media. Also, thanks to our sponsors, and there are many. We thank Spectrum News One and our presenting sponsor, Miller Koss. Also, our event partner, WizPolitics.com, as always, for joining us in their series of sponsors, which include UW Milwaukee, Wisconsin Academy of Global Education and Training, 1125 at Pabst, Milwaukee Police Association, the firm Consulting, the Medical College of Wisconsin and Spectrum News One. We're gonna turn and burn, do another one of these again on July 16th, this time with Peggy William Smith of Visit Milwaukee. Obviously their world has changed as all of our worlds have changed with the uh, pandemic and what has happened with the Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee. What will be the role of Visit Milwaukee with that event and moving forward, we will discuss on July 16th. Go to milwaukeepresspub.org to register for that event. We would love to see you for our next virtual newsmaker lunch situation. And if, while you're there, if you liked what you saw today, please, if you can give us a donation, please, 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 because uh, we're trying to stay afloat too. We're a nonprofit. We want to continue our mission. We want to serve you. We want to do more events like this and uh, anything you can do to help with us financially would be deeply appreciated. Thanks to our great crew. It's fun talking baseball soon. Hopefully we'll be watching baseball, a 60 game season. We'll take what we can get. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.